role at LinkedIn is uh, that of heading up international products and data products. Um, uh, before joining LinkedIn, I was in consulting. Uh, and before that, I have a technical background. And I was also um, uh, doing research at the university. Especially in Europe, LinkedIn has LinkedIn's popularity has grown immensely over the last couple of years. I think it's one of the few social networks with a, with a steady growth. Why has LinkedIn become so successful as such a vital business tool over the last couple of years? Well, I think that fundamentally it's because it's useful to a lot of professionals um, and uh, the uh, network uh, has a reach that's now globally at 380 million members. In Europe we have approximately 100 million members, so a large share of our member base is there. And in the German-speaking region, including Austria and Switzerland, we have now 6 million members uh, and we are growing approximately by 1 million every 7 or 8 months. Are there any differences between the usage of, of LinkedIn in, in Europe versus the US? Because I, I'm, a, I'm a member in a couple of international groups and I kind of have the impression that until now Europeans tend to use LinkedIn as a CV tool, basically, while Americans use it more for ongoing communication on a, more, more regularly, you know. Um, so, uh, there are differences between countries, we see that very often. Um, I would say that actually in the German-speaking region, uh, the level of engagement of members is actually pretty high uh, compared to many other countries, meaning that they find it useful not just as, or are starting to find it useful not just as a tool for putting their identity online, but also to network and also to drive interesting insights, like for example, reading articles. Uh, including just this week we launched the German publishing platform which has a lot of insights about business. So that's uh, something that uh, we are seeing increasing, increasing adoption over time. I've been using this, this publishing platform since it became available in the US version. I, I you always use the English version because you usually roll out features a lot earlier there. And LinkedIn has focused on, on this part, publishing and business magazine a lot. So that, I, I guess that has to do with content marketing, but you started that quite a while ago before everybody was talking about content marketing and storytelling. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I think as it relates to the publishing platform, um, uh, we are now seeing a big adoption. We launched it in English first because oftentimes we want to try products before rolling them out globally. Um, but we are seeing big adoption. For example, we now have one million uh, members who have contributed to the publishing platform globally. Uh, Three million posts since we launched a year and a half ago in the English-speaking markets. Um, and uh, we are adding 130,000 posts a week. So uh, we are hoping to replicate this in other markets. We launched Spanish, Portuguese, and now German this week uh, and and so uh, I think that the content piece is f critical because it actually creates the place for people to have conversations about topics of interest as it relates to content marketing um, I think this is a part of a bigger trend in which um, the industry is shifting away from uh, display based advertising the banners right uh, and more into marketing that's based on real material real content that's interesting and useful to people uh, and they, they can use that for decision making so I think this is part of a much bigger trend and definitely LinkedIn is leading this in the B2B space <laughs> You probably don't know this, but the Austrian online market is pretty special compared to the rest of Europe. Here we have a couple of big media agencies and as far as I know, Austria is the only country in, in Europe where still in 2015, I think more than 90% of online budgets are spent on display advertising and on banners. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very small ecosystem and it's, it's really hard to break that, but uh, I think the, few, the pressure will become much higher. It's, it's more and more difficult to get anybody to click on a banner so people will be forced to do, to do content marketing. We are seeing this uh, development happening globally. Uh, display has been really strong even in the United States for a long time, but then when people started realizing the power of the more social forms of content marketing, the transition started happening within the industry relatively quickly. I mean, Facebook has been leading this and Twitter and, and, and we as well. And so uh, once you get to that point, there is almost a switch, a, a, a state in a transition in which uh, the entire industry quickly moves to a different form of, of marketing. 
Yeah, I'm still waiting for that. I hope that that happens soon in Austria on, on, on this scale. Um, in the past, LinkedIn has been quite flexible in terms of development. What I mean by this is you launched some features, for example, at the Q&As, uh, and then when they did not work out that well or did not fit your strategy, you, you removed them. I think that that's, a, that's very important to do that. Uh, what are your core features now? And what, ca of course, that's a very interesting question from our readers. What can we expect in the next say one or two years, uh, which features or which parts of the platform are you going to focus on mainly? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I don't, we don't typically don't speak about future product introductions, but if you think about where LinkedIn has been putting um, a, a lot of our investments in terms of acquisitions, but also organic investment, um, there are three big value propositions on the user side. First of all, uh, identity. We want to be the place where people put their uh, professional identity and represent themselves online. That's a core part of the network. Uh, the second one is the network itself, is the connections between people. And making it easier and easier for people to connect and communicate. Um, so uh, we have now a very strong presence on mobile, and that is actually a medium that facilitates this type of connectivity. So the mobile part is a, a very important area of investment for us. And thirdly, content. Our biggest content, uh, biggest acquisitions have been in the content space in the last couple of years in terms of uh, uh, the uh, money we spent. The latest one was uh, a uh, video learn e-learning platform called Linda, uh, which is actually has a uh, subsidiary here in uh, Austria and Graz. That's called video to brain Yeah, I, right? I know that company. So uh, video brain now belongs to LinkedIn and it will be uh, part of the LinkedIn ecosystem going forward. So first of all, the, the reason why we bought uh, uh, the e -learning, this e-learning uh, platform is that there is a, uh, uh, a, a need for members uh, to develop their skills, professional skills. And Linda is, and video to brain are uniquely positioned in this space of learning specific business skills, uh, like leadership, like team management, like um, even using tools like Photoshop or Excel and Word, things that are very practically ac applicable to somebody's career, because if they learn some incremental skill like that, maybe they have a better chance of getting a promotion or getting a raise or getting into that next job they need. So there is a very strong synergy between opportunity in the job space and the skills you need. Um, and if you think about uh, you know, the future, um, you know, Linda is a great platform where we can actually uh, offer all of these contents and we know that some of the members would like to actually consume it because we know what their profile looks like and so we can actually suggest recommendations for these courses. Are you planning to you know, open that system, for example, like uh, let other members use it to, to produce courses or uh, are you going to, to give them away for free and produce them yourself or maybe sell them or have a freemium model? So Linda currently and video to brain are on a paid basis um, and um, uh, the content is very high quality uh, so uh, definitely that is a distinctive piece it's not a self-generated uh, uh, learning session it's actually using uh, known uh, uh, experts in the various fields to, uh, who actually participate in the creation of content. We have created a network of experts, both here in Europe, uh, in three languages, in fact, in German, French, and Spanish, um, and also in the United States in, in English. Um, so for the moment, the platform is, is really an expert-driven platform in terms of content creation. But on the publishing side, um, individual members can contribute to LinkedIn um, and showcase their skills and their knowledge on the on the blog side of LinkedIn. Actually, how do, how does LinkedIn's business model work? I'm always interested in trying all features. So when I started using LinkedIn, I, I bought a. That I think that the cheapest paid account, which was uh, a lot cheaper back then, and I, I seem to have a lifetime price on that. I was I was quite surprised. Uh, but most people in Austria, most of my friends use the free version. So what is your business model? How, how does LinkedIn make money by a subscription or other different revenue streams? Um, so uh, LinkedIn has um, uh, essentially uh, three uh, areas of business. Um, and the biggest and the first one is the recruiting solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, this accounts for 60% of our revenue. Um, so it is actually a large part of our monetization is recruiters, large companies, recruiters paying for uh, access to our database of, of, of uh, our resumes and, and, and profiles. Um, and the other very big part of the business is marketing solutions. So 
again, large companies uh, purchasing marketing uh, products on, on the LinkedIn platform. Um, on the consumer side, uh, the vast majority of our members are actually using the free tool because LinkedIn's value, even in the free product, is extremely uh, strong. Yes, you, do not, you actually do not force people to, to upgrade. We don't. And, um, and in fact, uh, you know, this, the subscriptions uh, business is, uh, is, you know, is a small part of the consumer side. Um, what we uh, really aspire to is to create a tool that's useful to consumers um, and then really to uh, monetize on, on, on the B2B side uh, because that is um, a very scalable way of doing it and, um, and it creates synergies between the two areas of the business. I know this is uh, this is very new. It happened this week, I think. The, the decision about uh, safe harbor. Are you? Are, are, does that worry you? I, I know it's it's really new because it's, it's uh, it will may it may become a problem for all big companies to store data in the US. First of all, this is a, a topic that's still in evolution, yeah. so we'll we'll see what will come out of it. Uh, I'm not an expert in in the legal yeah. side, but I'm happy to Gudrun to uh, to uh, uh, connect you with uh, with our uh, uh, folks in uh, in the in Europe who are following these things more closely. One more question about your business model. Uh, of course, LinkedIn is a huge platform, lots of members, and you generate a lot of data. Uh, are you are you using this in the sense of of uh, big data evaluation or trends or you know well uh, big data is a big topic um, uh, definitely LinkedIn uh, is a big data company in the sense that a lot of the value that we can create is by connecting uh, um, the various nodes of our network and we call this the economic graph and the idea is that we are creating in a way a digital representation of the world's economy uh, so this is not only our 380 million members but there are millions of companies that are represented on LinkedIn, uh, millions of jobs, and then all the skills that you need to get those jobs and all the content that you would need to, uh, you can use to learn those skills. Um, and so if you think about all of these items uh, and the connections between each other, the real value from the platform comes by connecting these together. So for example, um, when you land on LinkedIn, you see a module that says jobs you may be interested in. Uh, this is coming out of a big data analysis that looks at people who are in your current job, what are the types of jobs they went to next, right? And what are the type of jobs that might be interesting for you in your region and your location? Uh, so this is all possible because of the big data side. Um, and so we see big data as a tool, not as an end, uh, to create uh, value for the members. <laughs> One of the most fascinating parts about LinkedIn to me is, is your your uh, algorithm for the status updates. It, uh, yeah, few facts are actually known about it. I, I experimented a lot with it, and I, I found out two things. It's very robust in the sense it's 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 hard to manipulate anything. It's a it seems like a very robust algorithm, and. Uh, how does that work? How does the system choose which updates in my network I see? I, like I said, I have been using LinkedIn for quite a while, I have a couple of hundreds of connections, so you, you have to select. The feed is actually one of the most um, important properties on the site because it's on the home page and so it gets a lot of traffic. So we put uh, a large amount of engineering time and product development time on, on making sure that the feed drives value for our members. And that is really the objective of the feed. It's that of providing members in a short amount of time, uh, the necessary updates that they need to get going in their daily uh, workday. Um, we are not in the business like some other social networks of keeping people for a long time on the feed. What we aspire to is to have people come in and out of LinkedIn in 15 minutes a day and get all the information they need to get uh, through their working uh, connections and get through, you know, through the business they need to do. Um, so it's designed in a different way from some of the other social sites. Um, what we have observed over time is that the type of content uh, in the feed really matters and the way you mix it also matters a lot. Um, the algorithms behind it are very complex, so I'll not go into the details, but uh, one of the things that we have observed over time is that the more social and viral content and things that can be shared actually do much better in terms of the uh, consumption and engagement of users. So that's one area where um, the feed is, uh, is very useful to, to users and, and, 
uh, obviously, you know, you want to mix that with other things that are useful to members, like, uh, for example, publishing posts and uh, that you can share uh, on jobs and other things like that. When a, when a platform becomes successful, there's usually the point where spammers turn up. You know, some people try to flood the feed, like post uh, ads or anything. Um, that hardly happens on LinkedIn. I mean, I'm sure it happens in the sense that there are people who try it, but uh, those, those things don't turn up. I think it's very vital because if that happens, people will get less interested in it. But uh, why, why is the filtering working so, so well? Um, so, um, there are a couple of uh, things that are important to uh, consider. First of all, the environment of LinkedIn is very different from other social networks. And the professional context actually already is a, uh, is a, is a barrier to spammers coming in uh, because they know they will get less traction on a, a platform like LinkedIn. So that's already a self-regulating um, um, situation. Um, in addition to that, uh, we certainly have algorithms that will spot low quality content and uh, the primary way to do that is to look at how many clicks and how much engagement does the content get. If it doesn't get a lot of engagement, it's likely that it, it's not very interesting and, and, and the main reason for that is typically that because it's not, not good content. And finally, we also have algorithms that will spot, spot illegal content things yeah. that shouldn't be on any site. Um, and we have a uh, trust and safety team uh, that's distributed globally who will actually intervene in these cases. Um, uh, but that's a very, very small percentage, a tiny, tiny percentage of the, of, of the events. What about groups? Uh, I, I, I think I read on, a, on, your, on the official uh, LinkedIn US blog that you are working on an update in the near future because, you know, groups haven't received a lot of, a lot of uh, new features recently. They, they work, but uh, yeah, what about LinkedIn groups? Yeah, so Groups as a product has been with LinkedIn for many, many years. It was one of the first products uh, on content. Um, you know, the world is changing uh, on the internet and, and Groups is a model uh, which uh, was very popular a while ago, And but people are now shifting more and more towards more interactive media like chat and, 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 and that type of uh, uh, interaction. Um, and so as we look at our portfolio of products, we, as you were mentioning earlier, we always look at what are the products that to sustain ut utility for the members and which ones are the ones that we need to rethink and either either we shut them down or we rebuild them, right? Uh, so you probably already seen there have been some improvements uh, some in, 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 on the group's user interface already. Um, and so there is a team in Mountain View that's actively working on, uh, on, on, on groups as on any other product of LinkedIn to, uh, to improve it for our members. Is uh, activity in groups still increasing or, or did you see a, a decline in, in usage? Like, because as you said, LinkedIn groups were available I think a while before social media came that popular in general. Yep. Um, you know, it, it depends very much on the group itself, right? Because there are some groups that get a lot of, uh, of traction and engagement, and there are some groups which are maybe less interesting, so there is less, the less, there is less engagement. So it very much, we, are, we have more than a million groups on LinkedIn, right? So uh, it very much depends on what group you're talking about. If somebody is new to LinkedIn, I mean everybody in the business has heard about has heard the name and they decide I'm going to start my profile now. Of course, first step is putting your CV online. But then if this person says I only have five to ten minutes each day, what should they do to, to, to make the most of LinkedIn? First of all, five to ten minutes is plenty uh, because you actually have uh, an opportunity to be very efficient on the tool, uh, the way it's designed. Um, the way I would I would suggest to use the tool is uh, to, in addition to the profile, to build a strong network of connections because the tool becomes uh, disproportionately more useful and, and helpful if you have a good network. It's a social network after all, so you want to have those contacts represented on LinkedIn. Um, and after that, uh, to start building either your content uh, uh, as an author or to start exploring the content on LinkedIn. There are millions of items of content that can be extremely useful and, and helpful, what, what, whatever your industry or your function or your job. Um, so I think that would be probably what I would suggest to a, a new user to do. About building that, uh, that network, there is a lot of discussion going on. How important is it to restrict connections to your own industry? There, is the, there are these Lion accounts, you know, that LinkedIn open networkers, you know, people who just try to, to get as many connections as possible. Personally, I, 
I accept every connection from people I know in real life naturally, but then virtual contacts are 90% from the online marketing industry in my case. What's better, as many contacts as possible or a narrower network but more focused? Well, it depends very much on what you want to get out of the tool. But in general, you know, the the the, the guide, the, the suggestion I always give to uh, my friends who ask me this question is, connect with the people you feel comfortable, you know, connecting in real life, uh, and think about. If this person then comes back to you asking for a recommendation or an introduction, would you be actually be comfortable uh, doing that? Do you know that person? Uh, and, and so I think that's a good guideline in general. Um, whether it's in your industry or not, uh, it depends very much on, on uh, what, you know, what your goals are uh, with LinkedIn. But um, you know, if you have connections in other industries, you never know if it could actually be helpful to you. Uh, in the in the future, and so that's that's something that I wouldn't exclude for that reason. Why LinkedIn is getting more and more popular in in Europe, uh, Xing is stagnating or even losing users. I do have some ideas why that is. So, do you want to talk about that? No. Your opinion about Xing? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I will not talk about uh, 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 you know other players in the market, uh, but I think look, I think this is a market that's in in, in evolution. Um, um, in the recruiting business, there is a disruption happening, and this is one of the reasons why those professional networks are becoming so popular. And the disruption is that uh, that we are switching from a model in which uh, people are looking for jobs in, in, you know, to a model in which it's actually possible to look for people who might already have a job, but they are exactly the person you need, and so you can actually reach out to them. So I think that's one of the reasons why those social networks are becoming very, very, uh, very effective. Um, you know, LinkedIn's goal is to provide the best user experience to give a lot of value to users, uh, regardless of whether they're purchasing the services or not and to be a, uh, um, a, a tool for everybody to use globally. Uh, and so we put all of our uh, product investment in making sure that our product is as good as possible globally.